Central Louisiana. I'm Chef John Foles welcoming you to this great state of ours. These beautiful plantation homes reflect the fascinating history of our culture and cuisine, and I'd like to share this story with you. Why not join me and some of my friends as we visit the plantation homes of our state and cook up another great taste of Louisiana. Funding for this program was provided in part by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of Louisiana Gold and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. In the mid-1800s, it was considered common courtesy to provide overnight accommodations for your friends and family when they came over to visit. If there were garçons or young bachelors in the party, strict custom dictated that other accommodations must be provided, especially if there were young girls in the house. That's why these garçonniers, or gentlemen's quarters, were constructed. And to keep balance on the property, there was always a pigeonaire or pigeon house constructed on the other side. I can only imagine how cruel it must have been for the young bachelors to look out of that window onto the porch of the great plantation and see these beautiful southern bells walking around with a glass of iced tea and realize that they were so near, yet so far away. I'm Chef John Foles. Welcome to the Gassonier at beautiful Homer's House Plantation. Homer's House is located along the River Road directly beside the Mississippi River at Burnside between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. It was built in the early 1800s on 20,000 acres of land. My good friend Gaynell Moore is walking under this wisteria arbor. Imagine the sweet smell of wisteria in Louisiana in the spring. Look how beautiful those flowers are. This gorgeous statue of Eve by Powers is one of the prized possessions of the house, and you may have seen it in the movie Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte. And Gaynell was good enough to give me a special tour of the Belvedere, a little room at the top of this staircase. Boy, what a great room this is. Gaynell, what was this used for? Well, John, look at that river. From up here, you had a commanding view. Uh, the planner could have either come up here himself, he could have sent his servants up here if he was expecting visitors, or if he was expecting some goods or supplies. This was like our interstates of today. Uh, they could have come up here to see if the boats was coming in. And also, on the other hand, you can imagine Mr. Burnside owned 20,000 acres here. So he could have come up here from the window. He could have surveyed all his kingdom. It was 6,000 acres of continuous crops growing here. The Burnsides were from Charleston, and this little Belvedere certainly is of Charleston architecture. Mm -hmm. It even looked like the little pilot house of one of those great steamboats. Imagine going up to that little room and surveying all of your acreage. Dr. Crozat, one of the recent owners of the home, collected armoires throughout the years, and many of them are displayed right here at Homer's house. Armoires like these contain beautiful wooden inlays that depict the craftsmanship and artistry of times gone by. Closets were very rare in plantation homes and sometimes were counted as an additional room and taxed as such. So naturally, armoires became an essential piece of furniture in all of these homes. Look how gorgeous all of this inlay is. Most of these are Louisiana, but some of them definitely came from Europe. Construction of this home dates back from earlier than most of the homes in this area. This library is in one of the oldest portions of the home built in the late 1700s. It's definitely based on a different architectural style, resembling the one that is very popular in Colonial Williamsburg. The dining room is also from an older section of the house and reflects this colonial period, complete with all of the pewterware serving pieces in the back and a gorgeous antique chandelier. This resembles a lot of the Shields Tavern look in Colonial Williamsburg. The carved cypress mantelpiece is an especially nice touch for a Louisiana plantation. This room is one of the two heart side kitchens in the earliest sections of the house and obviously one of my favorite rooms. It contains many of the necessary pieces of equipment that would have been used in the kitchen. This is an old copper bottle jack and you can imagine putting a chicken or a leg of lamb, clock wounding it and putting it in front of the fireplace. This is a cistern and of course the copper tells you that water heated here would have been heated in the home of a very wealthy planter. 
and wealthy he was. Mr. Barnside had 20,000 acres of land, 10,000 growing sugar cane. Someone said that there were more millionaires in that corridor of sugar than anywhere else in the United States in the early 1850s. I'm gonna have to check that out. There was a lot of money there. Now, when researching the foods of Homer's house, that was not very difficult at all because there were great journals that were kept on all of the foods that were served. And not only that, but many of the meals that were eaten there when visitors went back and wrote letters to their family about the experience at Homer's house. I have a note here, a letter that was written by a gentleman to his sister, and he said, we have fish, shellfish, and oysters from the lakes around the home. Venison, wild turkey, and ducks are brought to us every day by the Indians in the area. We get grouse and all of these other prairie birds from around the Mississippi River, and rice birds are shot in our own fields. We have vegetables from our garden of every species imaginable, and much more than we eat in the north in the midsummer. We have been eating green peas of the finest variety all year long. So you can see there was a lot of great foods back then, and that's a couple of the things that I'm gonna actually cook for you today. The ducks, the breast of duck that I read a lot about at Homer's house, and the peas. But how did people get to Homer's house anyway? Well, they used that river. You saw the little Belvedere, and people would go out and look at the river boats, look for the river boats coming up. And my guest in the kitchen today is gonna be Captain Joy Manthe. And Captain Joy is one of two, to my knowledge, there may be more, riverboat pilots on the Mississippi River, and she's gonna tell us a little bit about life on the Mississippi and uh, some stories about her own experiences uh, as a riverboat pilot, so she'll be in in just a couple of minutes. Well, ducks, ducks, geese from every species imaginable brought to the home by the Indians is what he said in the letter. So the first dish that I wanna cook for you today is a sauteed breast of duck and a peach brandy sauce. And if we look at the cutting board here, you can see that I have three breasts of duck. In the duck, I've left the skin on one side. This is just peel right off of the uh, Long Island duck. And I'm gonna season the breast with a little bit salt and of course a touch of black pepper. You wanna pound some of that pepper in here and get it nice and seasoned on both sides. Now also, I read that uh, ducks, uh, they didn't domesticate them very early because, well, let me grab this and put a little oil in my pan, because there was no need to uh, domesticate them. There were so many of these ducks right on the river that they could go out and harvest them every day without putting pens up to raise ducks. So I guess most of them would have been wild ducks. Once these are seasoned nicely, I'll go ahead and put them down into that hot saute pan. Now I'm gonna put it meat down rather than the skin down because I want to saute it quickly in that pan and if I put it skin down I may burn or scorch the skin first so I want to get it nice and brown on one side before turning it over. Of course I'm sauteing here in a little buttery flavored oil. You could use olive oil or any other oil uh, to saute the duck. Something that doesn't burn or smoke too quickly is best though because this breast will be cooked medium rare very quickly cooked and then flamed with a little, oh, your favorite bourbon or brandy, either one. Now, once this is done, I want to turn these breasts. As I say, let's assume that this would have cooked for a couple of minutes and got to about medium rare on this side. Then I would turn them over and cook it until the skin on the other side starts to get that really nice crisp brown color. And of course, I have some that's already to that state, so I'm going to move these out of the way. So I can show you exactly what these look like. And, oh, let me move this. Boy, oh, look at here. Isn't this nice? These old skillets are real heavy. You need a, a friend to cook in the kitchen when you're moving these around. Uh, I'm gonna turn it. Look how nice this is. Golden brown on one side, medium rare in the center, just as I promised there. And I just turn them once or twice. Make sure they stay rare in the center. You don't want to overcook them because they tend to get a little bit tough. Now, uh, I also found out that the Chinese was raising a duck that we all know of today as Peking duck. It was on a Yankee uh, a freighter that nine of these Peking ducks came into the country in about 1878, and those nine ducks produced the millions and millions of Long Island duck that we have in America today. So we can thank the Chinese for allowing us to have some Peking duck that gives us all of these duck varieties we have today. Now, I'm gonna put a touch of these fresh 
beautiful peaches. Of course, I can use any type of fruit, but I'm gonna use peaches because they grew peaches at Homer's House Plantation. And they're full of sugar, so you wanna get a really nice uh, sweet taste from the fruit over the duck. And of course, duck is always cooked with fruit. Now, I'm gonna have to be careful as I flame this. I'm gonna put a little brandy in it. Of course, you could use bourbon whiskey or whatever, but once you put it in, be careful because it ignites and it flames up for just a second. Of course, it's not a hot flame, it's just the alcohol burning off of the duck. But you wanna make sure that it doesn't get your hand. And then I can put some gloss. This is actually a reduced beef stock. And you can get consomme right in the cans if you want to, or you can make your own, or you can make a nice duck stock. You can take the bones of the duck once it's really nice and roasted, and then you can take it and boil those bones with onions and celery and bell pepper. Now, I would season this, again, with just a little touch of salt, a little touch of pepper, and I'd let this wonderful sauce reduce for just a minute or so, and I would have what I'm gonna show you right here. Just a gorgeous platter of nice duck that's already done, and all I have to do is pour the sauce on it. Look at this nice platter I'm gonna put on the cutting board for you here, and this is blue cobalt. Look at that gorgeous dark blue, rich dark blue. Homer's House had a complete set of dishes like this. Now I'm gonna pour some of the sauce right on top of the edge of the duck to make a really beautiful presentation. And then I can finish garnishing with some of these really nice colors, a little red, a little golden. And you notice that this breast is medium rare, certainly not overcooked by any standard. So look at that, beautiful duck from Homer's House Plantation, gorgeous breast of duck. Okay, well, the next dish was a pretty simple one to choose because I read about that in a letter that I just read to you a minute or so ago, and he said that they had peas of every variety growing in and around Homer's House, and they had eaten them for two or three weeks. So I want to show you this nice bowl of peas that he was probably referring to. These peas are a really nice sugar snap variety. You can see the little beans, uh, are, are they're not snap beans and they're not English peas, but you can see they resemble the English pea. And they're so obviously from the same family, but very sweet. We call them sugar snaps here in South Louisiana. And we always cook these sugar snaps with pearl onions, as you can see here, the little bitty tiny spring pearl onions and andouille sausage. Now, we use a lot of different smoked meats in our cooking, but the andouille is the cubed ham in the casing that we season with garlic and all kind of nice flavors. And then we smoke it for about seven hours in the smokehouse. And of course, we use it a lot in our vegetable cooking. And this recipe was probably exactly the way that it was done at Homer's House, the way I'm gonna show you right now. In my little pot again, I'm gonna put some of this buttery flavored oil and use margarine or whatever this. You can get this in the specialty oils department of your store. And you just wanna put a little bit of that oil into the bottom of your black iron pot and then season with your typical seasonings. I always like to use my Trinity, my onion, celery, and bell pepper. But I wanna use colored bell peppers today, especially because the peas are such a vivid green that the red and golden bell peppers really give this dish a nice eye appeal on the table. Look how pretty this is already. And I would saute these vegetables for just a second. You want to just kind of wilt them in the bottom of the pot like this. And then I would put my pearl onions in. I put about four or five of these really nice big pearl onions down into the pot. And they're so sweet once they saute with the other vegetables. So you just want to kind of stir them around in with the bell pepper. And I'm going to add a little touch of garlic here. We have to have a lot of garlic in our cooking. So a little touch of that garlic. And then the smoked meats, the andouille. I'm gonna put a little touch of andouille right down into the pot like this. And once I saute the andouille around for just a couple of minutes, I can start to add the peas. Now, these peas, you can poach them off first in a little chicken stock if you'd like, or if you wanna cook them al dente or just kinda to the tooth, a little chew, a little bit less uh, uh, cooked, you want to just kind of put them in raw. And that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to uh, fresh snap these. So I'm going to just put them right down into the bowl, like the, into the pot like this. Look how pretty that vivid green color is. And then 
one stiff saute is for a minute, as we would have done in Louisiana back then, we would have made a little light Creole roux in the pot, just a little touch of roux to make this dish a little heartier. And the way we would do that would be to sprinkle in just a touch of flour on top of the peas, just about a tablespoon or so. We're gonna make a light white sauce into the pot. Again, look at all those pretty colors. And then I could add a touch of chicken stock. I'm gonna add just a little bit chicken stock and this will actually boil those peas. I said not to boil them. Well, hey, we're gonna boil them in a nice Roubaix sauce in the bottom of the pot right here. And I would allow this to cook for about 15 or 20 minutes just until all of these good flavors of the smoked meats and the garlic and those beautiful little pearl onions all come together in the pot. And I also have some of these already done, so I want to show you exactly what they look like here. This is a really nice dish, and you can serve this any time of year. Look at this nice plate of the sugar peas. I'll put a little more color onto it right here. And just imagine what this would look like, not only on a everyday dish, but on a great holiday table. This is a beautiful dish. Now, what would I accompany this with? I also saw a lot of things written about the cobblers in plantation cooking. And this right here, naturally, since we use peaches on the duck today, we would definitely want to use peaches in our cobbler. And we could put a little cinnamon and nutmeg right on the top of it for extra color, but finish it with powdered sugar. Really a nice dish. Okay, that's my two or three little dishes from Homer's House that I discovered in all of those journals. And I promised that we would be talking to Captain Joy Manthe from the uh, Mississippi River. And I see Joy coming on in. How are you doing? Hey, I'm fine. How are you? Great to see you. How you been? How's everything on the river? Just fine. Huh? Just well, fine. it's so good to have you in the kitchen with us uh, today. Somebody was telling me the other day, I know you've loved the river for a long, long time, but somebody was telling me that even on your senior trip in high school, that you could have gone to Acapulco with the class, but your brother said, hey, if you want to stay on the river instead of going to Acapulco, we'll let you, uh, I'll buy you That's a ticket. Right. Is, that, is that right? Is that yeah, I went to a homeless house on my first trip on the Mississippi River. I went on the steamer Delta Queen for a weekend. So y'all, and, and was that when you fell in love with the river, or was it long before that? Uh, it was that? long before that. <laughs> uh, well, we're glad you did because I've heard so many great stories about the Mississippi from the times that you and I have talked together. And and in some of the writings at Homer's House, this Englishman, in fact, wrote back home and said that every morning before breakfast, they had to sit and have at least three or four nice mint juleps. Can mm -hmm. you imagine mint julep before breakfast? <laughs> and since it's one of these misunderstood drinks, I thought you and I may make the mint julep from Homer's House here. What I've... What I've actually put into my little chopper is some uh, mint leaves. There's a lot of variety of mint, four or five different types, different flavors. But in old days, we would just take sugar and the beautiful mint leaves, and we just kind of crush them in a martyr, you know, with a martyr and pestle, mm -hmm. and, and get that nice green, sweet look. But today, because of modern technology, we can use our little chopper here. How about putting in to the mint leaves some sugar now? So this you is, got some powdered sugar? Yeah, this is, run out this time. <laughs> no, this is powdered sugar. Remember last time we made the, uh -huh. the, the granulated, granulated sugar. sugar? And you can put a little touch of this, about a, put, put about a half a cup. This is simple syrup. Now, this is actually water and sugar cooked together to make a simple syrup, as we call it. And then I can put my little top on here and kind of crush this around. And you can see how it's all breaking up in here. And it gets real, real sweet. Gotta put your hand on top of here. And, and that's basically all we would do. We would take the mint and crush it in. Look at that spoon right there so I can show them what it looks like. Oh, and, and I would take the mint. Look, look how that mint just crushes so nicely with the, uh, with the sugar. And this would go into a big pitcher or bowl full of simple syrup, your favorite mm -hmm. bourbon, bourbon, a uh, uh, southern comfort. Some people even put rum in to cut the taste. There's a million different recipes for it, mm. but I think the, the, fa the, the most famous recipe is equal parts of bourbon, southern comfort, and simple syrup, and of course the crushed mint and sugar. Now guess what? Mm. I have right, a pitcher right. full of it, and I got some glasses in the freezer. Why don't you get them, and we'll go ahead and make uh, a couple glasses for us here. And you know, uh, Joy, I found out that even in the very early days of Louisiana, ice was available to everybody because we think of this 95 degree heat that we're in all the time in the summer. Uh, but they would actually send the little boats across the river to Donaldsonville 
And there was an old ice house there. They would bring mm -hmm. block ice from up north, probably on the riverboats. Uh -huh. huh? And uh, they would bring all of that ice in, and, and everybody would be able to do a nice big pitcher full of mint juleps just like this. Take a sip of that and let me know if it's any good, huh? Let me hear it. Let me hear oh, it. Oh, yeah. Uh, any Delicious. good? <laughs> Delicious. That's the spot. Joy, why a riverboat pilot? Why, you, you, had, you could do anything you wanted to in life. What made you choose a profession as, as a riverboat pilot? Um, basically, Don, I think it's just because I love it so much. I enjoy it. Uh, but I guess if I had to narrow it down, it would be because my fifth grade teacher told me that I couldn't do it. So to show her uh, that I could, I got my first license. And how she told me that I couldn't do it is when we were taking the standardized test in school, uh, the ones that you fill in the dot, it was, what do you want to be when you grow up? And uh, I put other, and I put a riverboat pilot, riverboat captain, and she told me, no, I couldn't do that. I either had to put nurse or a teacher because uh, that's what women were back then. <laughs> so uh, my best friend was going to be a nurse, so I went ahead and put nurse, and I just got my first license to prove to her that I could do it. How, how difficult is it to get a, a, a license? If I wanted to go get a license today as a riverboat pilot on the Mississippi, what would I have to do? Uh, it's a federal administered test by the United States Coast Guard. It's, um, it's a pretty hard test for the first class pilot's license. You have to actually draw the river mile for mile for the, the section that you're setting for. Um, they'll get, you go into the Coast Guard, they'll give you a blank piece of paper, and you have to put exactly mile for mile what's out on the river, whether it's um, the lights, how many times the lights blink, the pipelines, uh, what's being carried through Gee. the pipelines, the high lines, the bridges, the width and height of the bridges. It'd be very similar if you would go to the um, uh, motor vehicle department and get your driver's license, and they would tell you, okay, you draw the interstate 130 miles and put every <laughs> exit, every mile marker, uh, every type of tree that was along the interstate. Pretty, pretty difficult test. Mm -hmm. But I understand that your family has been in the business for many generations. Um, yeah, my great-grandfather started back in 1884 up in Rock Island um, on the Mississippi River in the upper Mississippi. And actually, he started uh, as some, similar to bringing ice back and forth. It's a little uh, grocery ferry boat and from there to Andalusia. And um, he started in 1884 and built the first boat solely for the excursion boat business, uh, which was just for passengers alone before there were packet boats for passenger and cargo. Right. Now, you said that, that he built the first boats where you would put the big bands on them and go from little... Uh, city to city along the Mississippi and South Louisiana, as well as I guess up the river, right. and uh, and entertain the uh, the little cities. Right. Huh? We used to go from uh, St. Paul to New Orleans. Uh, we'd winter in the upper river and uh, winter in the, in the lower river in New Orleans to St. Louis trade, and then summertime we'd go from St. Louis to St. Paul on excursion boats. Now, were there ever women as riverboat pilots, or is this something pretty new? Um, there are more and more women because of the fact that they've started allowing girls to go to Kings Point. Uh, the Naval Academy uh, back in the middle 70s. So we have more and more women coming out now, and they're on the ocean liners and the freighter ships, like Likes Brothers has a few uh, female pilots. They come out of the Naval Academy with a third mate's license, and then now they're progressing up to the captain of the vessels. But back in the early days, back in the heyday of plantations, like at Homer's house, you had women and hu husband and wife teams on the old steamboats, on the packet boats, as a necessity. So, so women were involved very, very early. Right. Now, I know that you've piloted many boats. You, you work today on the Mississippi Queen as a mate, uh, but uh, you've, you've piloted many boats on the Mississippi River. What, what was your most harrowing experience as a pilot? Oh, uh, see, I have a few harrowing experiences, <laughs> but uh, one I might say would be on a boat in Baton Rouge, um, Samuel Clemens River boat, and. We uh, were going up the river and had problems with uh, the propellers. One of the shafts uh, stopped and the line got caught in the wheel and uh, pretty much lost maneuverability. But one thing about the Mississippi River, we have so many boats around and it's like a big fraternity out there. Everybody watches out for everybody else. So I was able to get, you know, in, in good shape with the help of another boat. So it's pretty safe out there. Oh, definitely. Well, look, now you make sure that you told me you were going to allow me to come on one of those boats, Mississippi Queen, and do a little cooking. So you make sure you check things I'm out gonna, and let I'm me know try when. To that. Thank you so much for coming okay, to visit John. with us. I thank appreciate you. it. And thank all of you for coming to visit with us today as we continue to talk about plantations and cook up Taste of Louisiana. Let's take a look at these, some of these pots from home sauce.
Funding for this program was provided in part by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of Bruce's Yams and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. Chef John Fosa's Plantation Celebrations, Recipes from Our Louisiana Mansions, is a full-color 335-page book containing food history, recipes, and over 150 photographs from these southern landmarks. For your copy, send a check or money order for $28.50 to Louisiana Public Broadcasting, 7860 and Selmo Lane, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 70810. Or use your credit card by calling toll-free 1-800-973-7246.